May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. In May 1940, in May 1940, the unthinkable happened. As you may very clearly recall, there had been a war that had started in 1939, but nothing really happened of great note until May of 1940. And at that point, instantaneously, as it were, Germany attacked the Netherlands, Belgium, and France all in one day. It was a catastrophe because France had relied completely on having built the Maginot Line, what they thought was completely, in, completely impenetrable. It was a line of fortifications that, that followed the, the border between France and Germany. And the only other way into France was the Ardennes forest. And that was so dense, such a dense, dense forest, that there again, there was the belief that it would be completely impenetrable. So even though in France there were many French and British troops already for any attack of the Germans, they just could not have foreseen what actually happened. And that was very quickly, the Germans completely bypassed that Maginot line of fortifications and managed to get right through that dense Ardennes forest, and then they were in France. Once they get into the country, because they had bypassed everything that was felt to be a sure fortification, once they got into France, it was just a matter of days before they were able to march right through the country. And so, uh, by March 26, 1940, this was an absolute disaster. There were hundreds and thousands of British and French troops that were now stranded up at the northern coast of France near Dunkirk and basically facing the oncoming, very rapidly oncoming German forces behind them and the impenetrable English Channel in front of them. Now, it might have been that the British remembered the story from Exodus that we heard this morning, but certainly we can say that at that moment in history, people believed in the power of prayer. So the king declared a national day of prayer on March 26, May, May 26, 1940. The people were cramming by the millions into churches. There was a big service in Westminster Abbey that the king attended and churches and other places of worship were just mobbed with people praying earnestly for God's intervention. Now there was an evacuation planned they were hoping that perhaps at best they might be able to get about 40,000 troops out of France before the Germans descended and annihilated all of the rest of them. So that evacuation began at the end of the day of that national day of prayer. And as I'm sure you no doubt remember, there were an incredible number of highly unlikely events that took place after that day of prayer. First being, Hitler inexplicably decided that rather than advancing, and they were literally within inches, or metaphorically, but they were extremely close to getting to where the British and French forces were, but Hitler inexplicably decided to halt the advance by land and instead rely exclusively on the ability of the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, to be able to annihilate all of the troops. Problem with that was that there were unexpectedly strange weather conditions for the next eight days. Dense fog all over the English Channel, so it was extremely difficult for the Luftwaffe to knock off the various troops and ships. The other thing, as you probably recall, was that the English Channel was uncharacteristically calm as glass for eight days. So what that meant was that about 800 small boats were able to come out from Britain and because the winds were also uncharacteristically low, they were actually able to come right up to the beaches at Dunkirk. And then the small boats would, would get close to the beaches. The troops were wading into the water, jumping into the boats. Boats would take them to larger Navy boats, 
British and Canadian Navy boats that were in the deeper part of the channel and then ferry the troops back to Dover again and again and again. And so, over the, again, we thought that there would only be 40,000 at best that could get out. But over the course of the next eight days, with all of those highly unlikely conditions, over 338,000 troops, French and British, were rescued. And in fact, that represented nearly all of the Allied forces that were stranded in the north of France. Can, can we prove it, absolutely prove it was a miracle? No, but I think we would all agree that these were highly extraordinary events that took place after that day of prayer that really saved the day for the ability of the Allies to eventually defeat the Nazis. Now, what about the story in Exodus? Look at the remarkable parallels. The people of Israel finally had attained their freedom. And if you remember the stories that went up to that, it was just extraordinary. The number of times that Moses and Aaron had appealed to Pharaoh for their freedom. And the number of times that God had struck the Egyptians with incredible plagues. The number of times that Pharaoh cried out and said, please save me from these plagues and I will let you go. And then the number of times that Moses prayed to God, the plagues stopped, Pharaoh changed his mind over and over again until the 10th plague, which as you'll recall, was the striking down of the firstborn all around Egypt. And it was in the middle of the night of that night as every Egyptian household was wailing in pain with the loss. It was on that night that Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, get out, take your people and get them out of here, which they did very quickly. The problem was that it didn't end there, as we see. And in fact, God told Moses, get the people, this was after they were out a few days journey outside of Egypt. God inexplicably told Moses, get the people to camp here by the sea because I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart yet again and he will come in pursuit so that I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and his army and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And he did just that. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And the entire Egyptian army, probably about the most elite army of that time, that entire army with all of its chariots and all of its highly trained soldiers came in rapid pursuit of the Israelites. So similar to the situation in Dunkirk, all of a sudden we had the Israelites trapped between these rapidly advancing armies and the sea the deep blue sea. So what happened? The Israelites panicked. Can we blame them? They, they cried out to God. They also cried out to Moses. How could you have done this? Couldn't we have just died back there in Egypt? Why did you bring us out here to kill us in the wilderness? Can we blame them? Really? How many times in our lives, how many times in my life do I panic? when that sort of situation happens, not that I've been in exactly that situation. On a rather amusing note, someone once gave me two sets of cocktail napkins. Uh, on one set, it says, keep calm and carry on. On the other set of napkins, it says, now panic and freak out. So when people would come and visit me, I would offer them a cold drink and I would say, now you can choose between these napkins. Depending on your particular affinity, you can choose either to keep calm and carry on or to panic and freak out. So I, I give them a choice. Now, uh, maybe it's my particular group of friends, but I would say about two thirds of them, in including myself, generally tended to take the panic and freak out napkins. <laughs> Be that as it may, it reminds us in a very small way, but it reminds us that every day we have that choice. We could, as, as God said to Moses, tell the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be still. 
You have only to be still. That's the keep calm and trust God napkins versus the panic and freak out napkins. We've always got that choice. So what happened with the Israelites? Upon God's command, Moses reached out his hand. Now we could think about that as an active act of intercession. Just as intercessory prayer is such a strong feature of this church. And so it may very well have been that Moses, on God's command, was, was doing this act, this gesture of intercession on behalf of all of the people of Israel. And in response to that prayer, God brought about his winds, because of course all of nature is at God's command, so God used his winds to part the Red Sea so that all of the people of Israel, that vast number of people, could actually walk through to their rescue on dry land, and they did. And the waters formed a wall for them on their right and on their left. And the passage, of course, today ends by saying that Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So what lesson is that for us? when we find ourselves in challenging places where we literally find ourselves between the, the challenges in our lives and the deep blue sea, and we just think, how in the world are we gonna get out of this? The story is that even when we are in that kind of a dire situation, God can make a way where there is no way. But I'd have to say it's not always easy to remember that. I'd like you to take a moment to look at this incredible painting that Sandra put on the bulletin today. It's an amazing image. In the painting, we see two vast walls of water, one on the left and one on the right. But look in between those big walls of water and look at the calm. And look, presumably this is Moses. And presumably right behind him, the people of Israel walking on that calm place. It does remind me of something else, another story of the waters and God's power. And that, of course, would be when Jesus, when Peter asked Jesus to command him to come out of the boat, Jesus said, come. And Peter climbed out of the boat. And for a little bit, Peter was walking with Jesus in that calm place in the very center of the storm. The problem for Peter, and it's so tempting, is that ultimately he started looking at the wind and the waves and not at Jesus. And he lost track of that still calm place where Jesus was. And he started to sink until Jesus caught hold of him. And so that's the question as we look at this painting today, in what reality are we going to choose to live today? Are we going to choose to focus on those gigantic waves and how ferocious they are? Or are we going to look at that very calm place that God has created for us to walk in? Is that going to be our reality today? If you're like me, sometimes it's easier to see that if we look in the rearview mirror of our lives. We can look back at those times when we thought surely nothing could get worse, and then it did. But it's only when we look back that we can see that God never did let go of us, even in the bleakest and hardest times, that he did hang on to us, and that often there were things that came out of those times, ultimately in pulling us through those times, God did things in our lives that we never would have imagined to have been possible. So, unlike Peter, we can't physically see and grab hold of Jesus, but what can we do in order to hold on to that reality of the calm, still place in between the waves? Well, by worship, when we come here together, when we remember the power of God, by prayer, communally here and then in our own lives, 
and ultimately by placing our trust in God, particularly at the times when it seems the hardest to do. Now, when I was at seminary at Wycliffe, every morning when we gathered for morning prayer, we would lift up the needs of the world. We would lift up the current events, and they were the same terrible events that we had just heard about or just read about in the newspaper. Disasters, of course, of disease and of natural disasters and of, of horrors of warfare all around the world. It was always very grim. But somehow, when we were gathered together in that historic chapel in that loving and caring community, we felt that instead of that chaos of the world that we'd heard about in the newspaper, it all took on a slightly different slant. When we felt that we were in the embrace of a loving God who knew the end from the beginning, who was able to part the Red Sea and cause his people to walk through on dry land, when we remembered that somehow things didn't seem quite so out of control anymore. And the same would be true when we gather, as we can do again tomorrow for Kickstart, for morning prayer every Monday morning on Zoom, and when we lift up the needs of our community and of our world. That reminder that God is with us and he hears us. But as I end this story, I want to emphasize one thing, and that that was that the parting of the Red Sea did not turn out well for everybody in that story, and I think we need to pause for a moment to remember that. Yes, it was very rash and unwise of those Egyptians to go rushing into the Red Sea in pursuit of the Israelites. Surely at some level, at some moment, they must have realized this was perhaps not a wise move and that that sea may not necessarily remain parted, but of course, so many of them were just following orders and they perished in so doing. Because this is the Jewish New Year, I'd like to point out that our Jewish friends in the Talmudic tradition have a way of looking at this story. And that is that in their tradition, they say that the angels wanted to sing because they were so excited about the parting of the Red Sea and the rescue of the Israelites. But God said to them, how can you sing? when my children are perishing. Because God also loved the, the Egyptians, just as he loved the Israelites. And that's something that I think we need to keep in context. He, yes, he needed to save the Israelites, but at the same time, it brought him pain to see the Egyptians perishing in their sin and in their foolish acts. And so I wanna leave that as an encouragement for all of us when we feel that we might have perhaps done rash acts, foolish things, when we might be living with the consequences of what we've done. Or I wanna give you encouragement when you've prayed and prayed and you have not seen the parting of the Red Sea. God had not finished with the Egyptians. You'll remember that he said that his purpose was that the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. And intriguingly, the Egyptians were among the very first to embrace Christianity. Tradition has it that the Apostle Mark, very soon after the death of Jesus, that the Apostle Mark went to Egypt and very quickly there were Egyptian converts to Christianity. Was there anything in their historic tradition that looked back to Yahweh and the story of the Red Sea? Was that why they were so eager to embrace Jesus and this one all-powerful God? that was being offered to them. But certainly they, they accepted Christianity quickly. They turned those beautiful, vast pagan temples into places of Christian worship. The Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, there's the Temple of Dendur. It's an incredible place. And when you go inside, you can see the crosses that were etched in the walls because of all the Christians over the centuries that ultimately made that their place of Christian worship. So whatever your challenge today, whatever you might be thinking, and whatever you might be thinking that God hasn't delivered you through the Red Sea, and whatever you might be thinking you've made mistakes and you're dealing with the consequences of them, please remember the Egyptians and God's love for them also. And please remember the, God, the love that God has for each one of you, 
which is without limit. And please remember that regardless of what challenges you are facing right now, he is not finished yet. He will see you through in whatever way that is. He will never let go of you because you are too precious to him. So please remember that today. And for this, we can say thanks be to God. Amen.